السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ایا کنا پردو ویا کنستین آئی ہوپ یو گائز ڈوئنگ او گریٹ اینڈ ہیونگ اے ونڈرفل ڈے ویر ایور یو آر اینڈ انجوائنگ یور رمادان آئی نو آئی ایم ماشاء اللہ ریئلی تھورلی انجوائنگ دا رمادان اسپیشلی دا سہور ٹائم از ماشاء اللہ سو سو امیزنگ ماشاء اللہ سو لیس گیٹ ان ٹو دا ویڈیو ان ٹو ڈیز ویڈیو دا ریئیکشن از گوئنگ ٹو بی آن پرائم منسٹر عمران خان ایکسکلوسو انٹرویو آن ال جزیرا عربک ود اولا ال فیریز So I understand she is um, a journalist and uh, the interview was conducted by Al Jazeera um, channel. So um, let's get into the reaction and this video has been requested on my channel. So let's get on with the reaction. Al Khan Kala Jazeera TV ko diya gaya interview. In other words, this cancer hospital I was trying to build I needed to raise a lot of money. And so if, if I, I felt if I was not in the limelight, I would not be able to raise the money. So that's why I kept playing. But once you won the World Cup, you know, I'd achieved everything. So, you know, my passion was already gone. I want to do other things. You love your wife a lot. What is this impact that you took in your life that you were happy with everything you have done? لإنشاء مستشفى يتخصص بعلاج السرطان وهي التي ماتت بالسرطان I was the only son I had four sisters and of course you know mothers sometimes love their sons more even than their daughters but she loved me a lot and um, uh, you know I was very close to I was closest to my mother she died a very painful death from cancer I saw her suffer a lot And so, you know, it made me realize that here I was, I was a cricket star at the time, how expensive cancer treatment was. And I realized, how do poor people who get cancer, where do they go? Because I took my mother outside, outside Pakistan for treatment, because there was no specialized cancer hospital in Pakistan. And so the reason I built the hospital was because I felt, you know, in poor people, they end up selling everything for cancer treatment so that's what uh, wanted me to in memory of my mother but really for poor people so it's it's the only private cancer hospital in the world where the 70% of patients get free treatment and it's a private hospital كيف حولت هذا المستشفى من فكره الى واقع it was one of the most uh, <laughs> difficult thing If I had not learned how to struggle from cricket, I would not have been able to build the hospital because there were very difficult times, you know, there was so much money to raise that no one had any idea how to build a specialized cancer hospital in Pakistan. So I traveled everywhere. I met doctors in America, uh, Pakistani doctors working there. And then I met my, my first cousin was working in America. He then helped me organize the hospital site. He's brilliant. He's a genius. So he helped the hospital side. I then raised the money. I changed myself uh, to become a fundraiser. I was a very introverted person. I never, you know, had much of a, didn't meet many people. I was shy. I became the biggest fundraiser in Pakistan. مقربون منك قالوا لي تغير كثيرا بعد وفاة والدته. تغير لي الأفضل. لو كانت والدتك اليوم على قيد الحياة ماذا كانت ستقول لك؟ وانت اليوم رئيس وزراء باكستان شي واز فيري بيتريوتيك يو سي ماي مذر اند ماي فادر جرو اب ان كولونيال انديا وي ور ا كونكرد وي جرو اب وير ذا بريتش ور رولينج انديا اند وات از ناو باكستان اند وين اي جرو اب اي واز ذا فيرست جينيريشن اوف باكستانيز جرو اب ان ان اندبندنت كونتري سو All I remember is that she was fiercely patriotic. She hated the idea that we were, that we Muslims, we were at one time such a, uh, a powerful uh, nation in the world. And then us sort of becoming, you know, an enslaved nation. I guess she was such a proud person that she wanted Pakistan to be this, this great country. And, and my father, because both of them were, um, you know, 
uh, took part, they were involved in the Pakistan movement, you know, for our independence. Ji, Masar? I, I, well, you know, it's a long time ago when she passed away. And I guess because I built the hospital and it was such a struggle to build the hospital. It's called Sadka Jariya. So when you build something where poor people get benefit and, uh, and they pray, then the prayers go to her. من الرياضة إلى السياسة ما الذي دفع بشخص يملك بريق الشهرة إلى الخوض في السياسة ودهاليزها المعتمة إن صح التعبير Actually it was after my mother died I moved towards uh, spirituality and I started uh, you know change my direction and it happens to people sometimes in their lives ask themselves these two questions what is the purpose of existence and what happens to us after we die and when you soul search these two questions, it reads, leads you to the spiritual world. So uh, I was already moving in that direction. And after I built the hospital, uh, I always felt that Pakistan should be a welfare state on, based on the state of Medina. Uh, the Medina state built by a Prophet uh, وسلم, was the first welfare state in the history of mankind. And the objective resolution of Pakistan was by our founding fathers that it should be a welfare state. So therefore, uh, number one, I wanted Pakistan to be a welfare state, which it wasn't. And secondly, we were ruled by the, these two corrupt families. And I knew both of them. You know, I, I knew Benazir Bhutto and I knew uh, Nawaz Sharif. But they, were, they came into power and both of them were quite corrupt. They started making money. So corruption is something which destroys a country. Poor countries are poor not because they lack resources, but because their leadership is corrupt. So today, the developing world is, is poor because the, the ruling elites, the prime ministers and ministers and presidents of developing world, siphon off money, launder it into offshore accounts and and uh, I call my party the movement for justice yeah. because when you have justice, you don't have corruption. عام 1996 أسست حزب إنصاف Justice. ما هو الإنصاف الذي كنت وما زلت تسعى إليه؟ A society is only civilized when it's, it has rule of law. So again, the state of Medina, the, uh, our Prophet peace be upon him, the state he set up. The, the two main guiding principles were rule of law, Adal and Saf, and secondly was a welfare state. We had this corrupt ruling elite. Unless you, you bring them under the rule of law, the country has no future because, you know, when the, when the ruling elite, when the prime minister and, and, and the ministers start stealing from the country, the country, you know, the country can't survive that in Lebanon, for instance, right now. I mean, Lebanon, Beirut was the Paris of, of Middle East. But because of the corruption of the ruling elite, it is becoming a failed state. So therefore, uh, my fight in Pakistan was against this corrupt ruling elite, which was destroying, which was impoverishing, indebting our country. هل هذا ما دفعك لقيادة المجتمع الباكستاني للخروج إلى الشارع وقطة حراك كامل؟ Yes, it was. It was, uh, number one, I wanted Pakistan to be a welfare state. And number two, I wanted there to be rule of law and through rule of law fight corruption. So uh, there were these two entrenched families, which were, they're not two political parties. They're actually family parties. They only, the, the leadership runs in the family. So, um, so fighting them was like fighting a mafia. You know, they were entrenched, they had money, they had, uh, they used state resources. So it was a very tough struggle against them. Firstly, to displace a two-party system in, in, in a democracy is very difficult. In England, the two-party system stays, in the United States, in almost every country. Once you have two-party system, for a third party to come is very difficult. So it was a very difficult struggle. And then to fight people who were crooked and who had money who used media against you and personal attacks so it was a very tough struggle نتيجة هذه المواقف دخلت السجن كمعتقل سياسي كيف كانت تجربة السجن 
It was fortunately only for a week. I mean, I sometimes think that if I if I was put in jail, uh, you know, I would much rather not live, because you see, I have a very full life. I I live life, uh, you know, a very active life, and suddenly there was nothing to do, and I remember the day would not pass. I didn't know how to pass the day. I mean, I got some books, but you know. I, 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 I never experienced anything like that. في حملاتك الانتخابية انتقدت السياسة الأمريكية والأوروبية على حد سواء وأنت الرجل المنفتح على الغرب كيف توافق اليوم بين تفهمك للغرب ومصالح بلادك؟ You see, I understand uh, Western politics much better than most people because I've spent so much time there. For instance, I, the, the main criticism was this war in Afghanistan. I felt that it was uh, insanity what they were doing in Afghanistan. No Afghan was involved in 9-11 and you know, for Osama bin Laden and maybe a few hundred uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, to occupy a whole country and occupy for 20 years uh, and I don't know what they were trying to achieve because no one is sure of their objectives. If they were going after Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda was gone after two years or one year at the most. So what was the objective nation building, liberating Afghan women, democracy, but whatever they were trying to achieve was not going to be achieved through military means, through military actions. And so I, I was always critical. I, I always said that their objectives could not be achieved through military solution. And so for that, I was criticized, you know, this imperialistic uh, uh, attitude that anyone who opposes you as anti you I used to criticize the policy of my own government. It doesn't mean I'm anti-Pakistan. بعد نضال سياسي من عام 1996 وصولا إلى 2018 20 عام أكثر من 20 عام وصلت إلى رئاسة الوزراء كيف كان وقع الفوز عليك؟ If you treat politics as a profession, then I would never have gone into politics because I had everything. I already was a, the, probably the biggest name in Pakistan. I had enough money that I wanted in life. So why would I go into politics? Because, you know, politics, there was nothing for, for me in politics. The people go into politics, unfortunately, in our country. Either, no one knows them. Either they want to make money or they want to become a minister or something. For me, it was um, a mission. I felt that as my country, uh, you know, had given me so much and then um, I always wanted to see my country, uh, you know, on the cricket field, for instance. When I started playing cricket, we were right on the bottom. When I left, we were the world champions. So it gave me great pride to see my country rise. So my whole idea was to, you know, people like me who, who had everything, we should come into politics rather than those people who came into politics to make money. So that's why it was a mission for me. وعدت قبل الفوز بأن تحارب الفساد في باكستان خلال 90 يوم اليوم مرت أكثر من ثلاث سنوات إلى أي مدى تعتقد بأنك حققت ما وعدت به؟ I always maintained that the main corruption and the main corruption is the prime minister and the ministers I said that would finish in 90 days I think no one can point out to any corruption on, on the prime minister and his ministers no one and if any corruption on my own ministers came, I would be the first one to investigate. You know, we initiated a sugar in inquiry where a couple of our, few of our own party members were involved. So if there's anyone who does corruption in my government, my ministers, I take action. I ask anyone to point out any corruption in our uh, government. But of course, there are two types of corruption. One is the corruption which destroys a country of prime minister and ministers, but then there's a low level corruption. That's much harder because when a society gets used to corruption, when the government officers uh, at low level get used to taking bribes, it takes a bit, bit longer. And in our case, it's through automation we hope to eventually get rid of corruption, where there's less contact between the government officials and the people. And that's what, in, for instance, the tax collection collecting agency, that's what we're trying to do we, uh, to bring in automation. أغلب السياسيين في باكستان يعينون أقرباءهم في مناصب حساسة بحجة ضمان الولاء دعني أقول أنت لم تقم بذلك ألا تخشى أن يتأمر عليك من حولك? Our role model 
is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His two great qualities were sadiq and amin. He was uh, truthful and he was just. So when you are just, and that's the two essential qualities of being a leader, then you have to appoint people on merit, not because they are your friends, not because they are your relatives, because they deserve to be in the position. And if you look at the successful Western democracies, the leaders are honest, they are truthful, and they are just at their they award merit. So it's only when countries degenerate, when they have, uh, you know, poor leadership, when they don't have strong institutions, that they bring in their relatives and they bring in their friends. المعارضة تتهم سياستك الاقتصادية بالتخبط والفشل في تخفيف معاناة رجل الشارع. بماذا ترد على هذا الاتهام؟ We inherited the most uh, difficult uh, situation that any Pakistani government has ever faced. We had the highest ever debt. We had the highest ever fiscal deficit of our, our current account deficit, but the highest in our life, the biggest deficits. So when a country is in that situation, uh, it, is, it takes time for the country to recover. Because basically, you're trying to increase your income and you're cutting down your expenditure. So uh, when you have this huge deficit, your expenditure is more and you have your revenues are below. So by the time you raise your revenues and cut down your expenditure, it takes time. We were doing very well. Then came COVID and COVID-19 has affected the whole world. Pakistan, according to The Economist, is the a number three country which best recovered from uh, COVID. We dealt with the, the, uh, the, the virus as well as our economy. So we dealt, navigated the best. But, you know, then now we have the strange situation, highest ever commodity prices. Oil has doubled. All uh, edible items which we import, like uh, edible oil, like uh, wheat, like um, lentils, you know, which all of them have uh, gone up. Freight has gone up. So it's an imported inflation which we have, which is where, all, not just Pakistan, all economies in the developing world are struggling with it. لديك توجه لتنظيم القطاع التعليمي لا سيما المدارس الدينية ألا تخشى من ردود أفعال حادة دعني أقول من الجماعات الدينية التي ترى بأن مدارسها خط أحمر؟ You see in Pakistan we inherited three parallel education systems one a small one for a tiny elite so uh, about 800,000 Pakistani children go into English medium schools about uh, 33 million children go into the Ur Urdu medium schools and 2.5 million children go into Dini Madrasas. So there are three parallel systems there. And so what we are trying to do is to bring them closer, have one core national curriculum. So we are trying to, Dini Madrasas, we are trying to help them and with their consultation, add more syllabus there so that their children can also become part of the mainstream. And the English medium schools, we are teaching them Urdu. Uh, and, the, and basically everyone, we, are, we have a core syllabus up till class five. So we have a unified system of education. And, and it's been difficult because, you know, uh, for 70 years, this, uh, this three-tiered system has been going on. Uh, but I think uh, there's a consensus in Pakistan that like everywhere in the world, we need a, a, a core curriculum to be the same. تم تصنيفك أكثر من مرة من أبرز 500 شخصية مسلمة في العالم وأكثرها تأثيرا كقيادي مسلم هل لديك أي استراتيجية لتوعية الغرب حول الإسلام الحقيقي؟ The problem uh, with uh... Muslim leaders is that they have never actually tried to explain Islam in its true essence to the Western countries. And therefore, uh, when Islam gets maligned, there's propaganda against Islam, uh, there is not a proper intellectual response from the Muslim leadership. So therefore, we have this phenomenon of Islamophobia.
especially after, for instance, 9-11, there was no response from the Muslim leadership because terrorism has no relation to Islam. In fact, terrorism has no relation to any religion. When you say Islamic terrorism, it brands all Muslims. People can't tell the difference. How can, how can an ordinary person in the West, how can he tell the difference between a radical Muslim and a moderate Muslim? So this, these terminologies actually caused Islamophobia and unfortunately the Muslim leadership never explained it to the Western countries or the United Nations or to the European Union. As a result, Muslims in the Western countries have suffered from Islamophobia. في ظل تقاعس القادة عن تصحيح هذه الصورة، كيف ممكن أن يكون هناك حلول فعليا لحالة تصاعد الإسلاموفوبيا هذه؟ It has to be a joint response. It has to be a response by all the Muslim leaders, and we have forums like the United Nations. You have the United Nations General Assembly every year, where all of them can have a joint response. That's when it will make a difference. So just Imran Khan alone is not going to make that much of a difference. When we all get together, and all we have to do is make them understand that we have a completely different approach to religion than the Europeans or the Western countries. They get surprised when they insult our prophet or they make, they make fun of our prophet. They get surprised when we react because they themselves don't treat religion like we do. So all we needed to do was to make them understand that for us, when anyone insults or ridicules a prophet, it is the most painful thing for Muslims because he lives in our hearts and they cause us a lot of pain. You but, they, but they don't know this. You as a leader, did you try to do that? Oh yes, I in the United Nations in my first address to the UN Assembly, I, I said this. I, I explained to, well, to the Assembly that you know, a prophet is uh, Islam is uh, the most revered figure for us. We love and respect him. And we cannot bear him being insulted. Uh, just like, for instance, the Jews. I mean, Holocaust for them is a very painful subject, understandably. And, you know, they don't like anyone even misinterpreting or uh, having another version of Holocaust. They find it very offensive because it's painful for them. So the Western countries are very respectful the way they treat Holocaust is with great sensitivity. We want them to treat when they talk about our Holy Prophet with the same sensitivity. But that can only happen if we as heads of Muslim state all together bring this up and make them understand this. هذه هي الجهود على المستوى الدولي لكن على المستوى المحلي أطلقت هيئة رحمة للعالمين إلى ماذا تهدف هذه الهيئة؟ You see, we in our country, people, I think they, they love the Prophet. I don't know whether any other Muslim country loves him as much, but this country, they would die for the, you know, if anyone said anything to the uh, Holy Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, people would, uh, you know, people would uh, die for him. So. All I want is that, you know, this love should be converted to what the Prophet asked us to do, to his sunnah, to his sharia, to his way of life. Because the Quran orders us that we must follow the way of the Prophet because he is a living Quran. He personified what is in the Quran. So therefore, we are ordered to follow his way. So all I want a younger generation is to learn. So the Rehmat al Authority, there are various things, but one of the things is that in universities and colleges, we want there to be research done about his seerat, his life, so that our youth is aware of his life, his history. How did he change the world? How did he transform those Arabs into leaders of the world? How did two superpowers of the time crumble in front of this, this war of ideas, you know, which he, he raised the morality of these people he made them into leaders for them to understand that they are you know there's a western culture but there is an islamic culture you know you can't force anyone to follow anything there's no compulsion in religion but we must at least give our youth this option that there are two ways of life you know there you know there's so much social media there is 
ويسترن فيلمز الى اي مدى تعتقد بانك ستنجح في هذه المهمه خاصه وان الجيل الجديد متهم دعني اقول البعض منه متهم بانه جيل رقمي مهتم بالسوشيال ميديا متاثر بالغرب I was as an 18 year old to England my heroes were all english you know the pop stars the movie stars sportsmen they were all foreigners and so i try to follow them because you follow your role models all i want is a younger generation they should have a prophet peace be upon him as their role model because he was the greatest human being ever born on this earth no human being has achieved or can achieve what he achieved in this world all i want is a younger generation to know the qualities what did he preach what how did he transform human beings how did he change the characters how did he make them these leaders he was rahmatul alamin means that he was he was a mercy for mankind not just muslims so any human being that follows his model will rise because he set up a state of compassion of welfare where a state took responsibility of the weak and then he established rule of law he emphasized on the importance of education and then he created leaders by reforming their characters my point is our younger generation they can go into the digital world they can go anywhere but they must know the life of a prophet that is the idea of this authority that a younger generation which is now bombarded by information social media they must also know the way of a prophet تسعى لارساء حياه النبي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم على حياه الشباب انت كيف تطبق هذا النموذج well i you know it was about about 30 at the end of my cricketing career when actually i changed courses it was through a great sufi who uh, uh, all the sufis are lovers of the prophet and so he sort of changed my direction and i was already seeking anyway so the reformation of your character starts the moment you change your directions and you you make the prophet your role model so then you then you start reforming yourself it's not like a button you turn on and off it is a constant reformation of character so when you pray five times all you ask is you keep asking allah to show you the way of those he has blessed and he's blessed our prophet most of all not the other way not the way who've gone astray so all your life you pray that which means all your life you're trying to reform your character في ظل التطورات السياسية وسيطرة طالبان على أفغانستان ما هي خيارات باكستان للتعامل مع الوضع الجديد؟ You see it's a very difficult situation for Pakistan because um, the United States which is the you know, leading power they are in a state of shock of what has happened in Afghanistan because they never you know the people of United States thought that they were bringing in democracy and nation building and liberating the women that's what the people in the US thought so when suddenly the Afghan government collapsed and the Afghan army gave up without a fight and Taliban are back in power they can't understand what's happened and there's a lot of anger in the US so they're not thinking rationally but what they don't realize is that they are we are talking about almost 40 million Afghan Afghan people, human beings, and if they do not get aid very quickly, if they do not help these people very quickly, which already were 50 percent were below the poverty line, then there's going to be a huge humanitarian crisis. Chaotic Afghanistan could again have international terrorists. Already they have ISIS, and if that happens, you must remember that U.S. spent 20 years in Afghanistan and, and NATO. They have spent over two trillion dollars. So after all that, imagine if uh, if there is chaos in Afghanistan. The, if Afghanistan is worse off now than it was in, when they came in 2001. So therefore, it is very important for them to help. Uh, and and unfortunately, if things go wrong in Afghanistan, Pakistan will be the biggest sufferer because we have a 2,600 kilometer border with Afghanistan. <laughs> Afghanistan كيف يمكن أن تحمي باكستان أمنها؟ This is a big worry for us. It's if Afghanistan descends into chaos, there's very little Pakistan is going to be able to do because uh, 
when after the Soviets left in 1989 and Afghanistan descended into chaos and a civil war where hundreds of thousands of Afghans died, there was a fresh wave of Afghan refugees. So Pakistan already hosts three million Afghan refugees and if there's a further destabilization and chaos, Pakistan will be the country that will suffer the most. There's not much we will be able to do. Uh, you know, if we close our borders, how do we justify if there are people on the border and in, in dire need of humanitarian help? It's a, it's a very difficult situation for Pakistan. How will Pakistan keep the United Nations and the world around the issue of Kashmir? Where did this come from? We have uh, raised it internationally. What is happening in Kashmir is the worst violation of human rights and in a violation of international laws, uh, violation of the United Nations Security Council resolution. Uh, 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 Eight million people are living in an open prison uh, and there are about 900,000 Indian troops which are, you know, which are keeping them in this open prison. So we have raised it in every forum. We have raised it uh, in the OIC and we've spoken to Muslim countries, you know, but uh, Muslim countries have the, everyone has their own independent relationship with India, so we can't expect much. But we, but we as 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 Pakistan feel it's our duty to raise this on this issue on every forum, the issue of Kashmir. بالحديث عن العلاقات الباكستانية الهندية شهد تهديد من وزير الداخلية الهندي بأنه قد بأن الهند قد تقدم على قصف مناطق انتقائية دعني أقول في باكستان ماذا لو صدقت نيودلهي كيف سترد باكستان؟ If they do any strike in Pakistan, Pakistan will respond exactly the way Pakistan responded in February 2019. When they did a strike in Pakistan, Pakistan will have to respond. It is uh, this fascist BJP government in India, which uh, if it does that, which it did before too, then I mean it risks two nuclear armed countries coming face to face. Uh, and uh, you know, only mad people can think of this, the two nuclear armed countries coming face to face. People of India are more sensible. Unfortunately, they are being ruled by fanatics. Well, these days, uh, not much. I have been very busy. These three years, has, there's been no social life or anything. So, uh, you know, the only thing my, is to go up in the mountains. When in the summer, I spend, uh, you know, some weekends up in the mountains. But that's about it. As a child, I grew up spending my summer holidays in the mountains in the Himalayas. So I, I was always in touch with nature. I was always an environmentalist because I knew Pakistan has some of the most beautiful mountain scenery in the world. I've been everywhere in Switzerland and in Austria, but nowhere do you have the beauty you have in, in the Pakistan, in the Karakorams, in the Himalayas, in our mountain ranges. I always uh, thought that the environmental degradation by our, by our governments allowing our forests to be cut, trees to be cut and our environment destroyed, wildlife disappearing. So I always thought if I ever got the chance, I will start again reforestation in this country and so that our wildlife comes back. And so that's why we started this huge ambitious 10 billion trees tsunami we call it we're planting we've, all, we've already planted two and a half billion trees mashallah ترتدي في كثير من الاحيان الزي الباكستاني ما الذي يعنيه لك it it means that i'm a prime minister of a country when over 90% 94 95% of the people wear these clothes so who am i representing am i representing these vast 90% of the people or, or a tiny sort of westernized elite and I consider myself, uh, you know, Pakistani of my people. And I think they, they don't want to see their leader uh, not uh, representing them. Uh, we have this colonial hang-up, unfortunately, in ex-colonial countries, where you always, the elite always wanted to look like the colonialists, so they used to ape them. <laughs> it's what my people wear, although I'm very comfortable with uh, Western clothes too. But, uh, you know, since the prime minister, represents his people, that's why I wear my Pakistani clothes.
أصبت بكورونا كيف كانت هذه التجربة؟ Well, my wife and I got it uh, both of us at the same time, and so it was five difficult days. You know, where we slept a lot because you don't have any energy in you. But I was uh, seventh day I was working again, but I was still weak. It took me about eight nine days to recover. رفضت إغلاق البلاد في فترة كورونا والسبب. Yes, for simply one reason, that I wanted to know if I shut my country down, what will happen to the daily wages? What will happen to the informal workers who have to work every day to have money to feed their families? So if I shut the economy down, what will happen to the taxi drivers, to rickshaw drivers, to the to the ones who have stalls where they have sell to feed their families? So I, you know, I did not want to crush the poor. And that's why we came up with smart lockdowns. Just in certain areas, we used to lock them down. But I just, I mean, I could not bear. I mean, they would die of hunger. So you're trying to save people from corona but kill people from hunger. I was not prepared to do that. Uh, I don't know. It's, I guess someone who... Uh, Actually, who was very fortunate, privileged. Allah was very kind to me. He gave me almost everything I ever wanted. So in return, I feel it's my duty to do my best for my fellow human beings. And I try my best. That's it. أنت قدوة لعدد كبير من الشباب في العالم العربي والإسلامي. وهذا الشباب بعض محبط البعض يعاني من البطالة من شؤون معيشية صعبة في بلاده ماذا تقول للشباب العربي والمسلم؟ You see, we human beings uh, are God's greatest creation, أشرف المخلوقات and most of us don't realize how much potential Allah has given us because we have very small ambitions we have very limited material ambitions you know, designer clothes and fast cars and, you know, we are as big as we think, as big as our dreams are. So, you know, for, to the Muslim youth, I would say, have big dreams. You know, think of yourself, the, the bigger you think, the higher you will get. And, and, and the dreams should never be material. Because if you, if, if anyone thinks that happiness lies in making a lot of money, they will never find happiness. Happiness lies when you serve other human beings. Happiness lies when your soul is happy and your soul is connected with Allah. And so when Allah is happy, you're happy. And, you, and He is happy when you help as human beings. All the great people in this world always thought above themselves. You know, they like a prophet. They didn't come into the earth to make money and build big buildings. They came for other human beings and that's why they are still loved. Wazira TV ko interview diya Wazir Azam Imran Khan ne aap mulaisa kar rahe the apni TV screens par Wazir Azam Imran Khan ka is mauke par ye kehna tha ki Pakistan ka farz hai ki wo Kashmir ka mamla har satah par uthaye agar Bharat ne hamla kiya to hum waisa hi jawab denge jo February 2019 mein diya tha unka ye bhi kehna tha ki Bharat ke awam ba shaur hain lekin wahan junooniyon ki hukumat hai Afghanistan ke bare mein Wazir Azam Imran MashaAllah, where do I start? MashaAllah, MashaAllah, may Allah bless Imran Khan. Just last few pointers when he said that he wants the youth to think bigger, but don't think bigger as it comes to materialistic think about pleasing your Allah if Allah is happy then you're happy amazing thing he's just said there so the happiness lies in when you help another human being mashallah he is so knowledgeable alhamdulillah I mean I cannot I think my words are not going to be enough to just talk about him in this video because I don't want this video to be very long the content of the video was already long but mashallah he has a vision and his vision his um, 
His role model is definitely our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and as he said that um, there is no better human being ever been on this face of this planet um, than our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the leader for the whole Ummah, not just for the Ummah, for the whole mankind he was sent down and the way our prophet was he was just he was a walking quran he he was the biggest example for all of us um we shouldn't have any other role models we should have him as a role model our prophet وسلم, if we read on his life we get to learn so much from him and that's one of the reason i absolutely adore imran Khan because um, he is he follows the examples of our Prophet Sallallahu He wants to make Pakistan the way uh, our Prophet Sallallahu made the state of Medina, where everything was on truth, just amazing. I mean, there are, I, I, I don't know, I, I think I just love, I just have so much respect for Imran Khan as a person tremendous amount of respect i have for this man may allah protect him may allah protect him from all the enemies may allah protect him from all evil eye i just cannot thank imran Khan as overseas pakistani how he made us feel proud and he in this video he touched so many good points that you know pakistan has so much to offer there's so much tourism there he's working on that he's working on education he's working on health these are the basic necessity necessity things that one country needs to progress to prospect prospect in 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 the world unfortunately there have been um few few corrupt uh, politicians in the past where they have become a hindrance if i'm right to say they have become a hindrance in the uh, prosperity of pakistan you know <sighs> may allah give them hadayat that's all i can say and may allah um keep bestow his blessings on um, you know our uh, prime minister imran khan he's a hard-working leader he's a hard-working man and he's he's honest man and um, that's all i can say i hope you guys enjoy the video i absolutely loved this um uh thorough interview and uh, i think i don't know the i think her name was ola al faris she was a very good journalist and i really liked the question that she asked as well so huge respect for our leader prime minister imran han i guess i will see you guys inshallah very soon in my next video thank you